Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Somerset County Library System Lecture on the Dead Sea Scrolls, the always fascinating topic of these remarkable documents 2,000 years old. Let's proceed. So a map just for some orientation. Um, you can see Jerusalem there in the uh, upper left. And the site of Qumran, which I've highlighted for you, just to the east of Jerusalem, I mean, there's some miles there, obviously, mainly desert, as you'll see, is the site where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found starting in 1947, 1948. We'll get to that in a few moments. And it is a location on the northwest shore of the Dead Sea. Hence, the texts are referred to as the Dead Sea Scrolls. For those of you who have been to Masada, you can see that at the very bottom of the map, at the southern end of the Dead Sea, and in between is the site of En Gedi, and you'll see why that's important. And to the north of Qumran is the site of Jericho, and those will all re reverberate in our presentation this evening. So here are our basic definitions. Qumran, site of the Essene community on the shore of the Dead Sea, and in a moment I'll explain to you what we mean by the Essenes. Dead Sea Scrolls, library of 800 plus documents, mostly Hebrew, some Aramaic and a small number in Greek, written by the Essene group resident at Qumran and deposited in the caves, flourishing between around 150 BCE, middle of the second century BCE, down to the year 68 CE, about a 200 plus year period, as you can see. Now, here are the caves. Um, this is desert region. Uh, nothing grows in this region except in a few places where I'll, you'll see some greenery. But basically, we're talking about a vast wilderness known as the Judean wilderness. More of the caves. Flowing to the uh, over here is what we call the Wadi Qumran. Wadi is the Arabic word for a dried up riverbed, also used in Hebrew today. And this will flow with water in the rainy season, which are the winter season, winter months of November, December, January, February. Everybody wants to know, how does anybody live out here in the desert? Well, you can collect rainwater from that wadi during the rainy season of the winter months and conserve it in uh, cisterns, which they did. And you can see that even though this picture was taken in October, when I was there with my wife last time, October 2022, um, you can still see some greenery down there in the wadi riverbed. Uh, more of the caves up close. And this one, which is where we'll start our story called Qumran Cave One. Now, if I were giving a lecture on some other topic, let's say Homer or Shakespeare or whatever it was, I would not have to discuss with you the path to discovery. That's because we've always had Homer. Uh, we've always had Shakespeare. None of that material was ever lost. It's always just been part of our literary cultural heritage. The story of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls is so fascinating, however, that I always spend time, in fact, almost half a lecture, as you'll see, talking about the discovery of the scrolls because it all fits into the narrative that we're telling. Uh, I also want to mention uh, that we will take a break about halfway through. So if you have any questions that you would like answered, put them into the chat during the first uh, 20, 25 minutes of our time together this evening, and uh, we'll uh, handle those questions. A very short break, five minutes, six, seven minutes max. Don't worry if we don't get to your questions. There'll be plenty of time at the end when we'll do a proper uh, Q&A and discussion. But I will take a little bit of a break just to make sure everybody's on board and we're all uh, together and you're understanding the narrative here. Now, in 1947, um, a Bedouin lad was shepherding his gate, his goats in the region that I just showed you. Let's go back and look at the cave. But this whole region looks like this. And a goat strayed from the herd. Uh, goats are great climbers and quite independent. And he and the goat walked into this cave. Now, the only people who live in this region are Bedouin. So that's what's happening here in the 1940s, 1947. The young Bedouin lad, smart, experienced shepherd that he was, uh, didn't go climbing up there to go find the goat. He took a stone and he threw it into the cave with the intention of scaring the goat out and have the goat return to the herd. 
Uh, but instead of the thud of a stone that you would hear against the ground, he related this whole story later, instead of the thud that you would hear of a stone against the ground, he heard a ping. So he threw another stone in and heard another ping. And now he was curious enough that he climbed up and he entered the cave. We lose track of our goat, by the way, I say with a smile. Always we hope the goat safely returned to join the family, rejoin his family. Uh, and in that cave, he found these two earthenware vessels that you see on the left, clay jars. And here's a photo of one with its lid on and one with its lid off, to give you a sense of, the, of these jars. Altogether, half a dozen of these were eventually found. And in those jars, he found complete scrolls that you see here on the right. I mean, worn, but nevertheless still complete with Hebrew writing on them. Um, here is a picture of our friend Muhammad Adib on the left, uh, who discovered the scrolls, uh, the first ones, along with his cousin Juma Muhammad. Uh, he, they posed for this photo later on. The um, Bedouin speak Arabic, uh, but in those years, to be sure, now 75, 76 years ago, uh, most of the Bedouin were illiterate. They couldn't read or write their own language of Arabic, never mind a language such as Hebrew. So they wouldn't have been able to read these documents. Uh, so they did the following. Uh, I didn't highlight Bethlehem on that map, but when I showed you the map in the beginning, you may have seen Bethlehem there as well. That was their local center, which is to say the Bedouin will be out in the wilderness for, let's say, a month or so. But every uh, so often they need to go into the city to trade. They will trade their wool from the sheep, uh, their goat hair, if an animal's died, the hides, uh, and of course the dairy products from the sheep and goats. They'll go into town and sell all that material and they will buy what they need. A pot, for example, they don't do metal smithing per se or manufacture pottery. So whatever they would need, they would, they would do in Bethlehem and they would do this more or less on a monthly basis. That was the life of the Bedouin. In Bethlehem, um, they took the scrolls that they had found and they visited Kando, whom you see here, who was a shopkeeper. Now, Kando belongs to the Syrian Orthodox Church um, and uh, a Christian. You can see the um, crosses there in his shop. So he had three different things happening in his shop all at once. Uh, his main day job, if you will, was shoemaker. So he, you know, he's a cobbler and he's making shoes and so on. Um, which means he always needs leather, right, from the Bedouin, you know, from the animal skins and so on. Uh, but he also has, because Bethlehem is naturally a great pilgrimage site for Christians, he also has a little tourist shop, gift shop kind of there, selling, as you can see, crosses and so on for Christian pilgrims. And he also has, he's a busy man, he also has a small antiquities trade going on. There are no real laws governing the trading of antiquities back in the 1940s, in fact, back into the 19th century, which is how the British Museum, the Louvre, the Berlin Museum, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, to mention the big four, were all able to build their incredible collections of material from around the world, including the Near East. So documents and this and that can come and go and be sold through an antiquities dealer like Kando. Now, Kando, more educated than the Bedouin, realized that he was looking at Hebrew documents, not that he could read Hebrew either. He would have spoken both um, Arabic uh, and liturgically, the Syrian Orthodox Church uses Syriac, which is a dialect of Aramaic. Through prior dealings, he already had known and come into contact with Professor Elazar Sukenik, and there are the years of his life, uh, the founder of the Institute of Archaeology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So by the 1940s, Sukenik is well known throughout the land. And uh, Kando um, decides that he's going to sell the scrolls. Now, there were seven scrolls found altogether in those jars. Uh, and he divided the lot. He offered three of them to Sukenik, and I'll tell you what happened to the other four in a moment. And Sukenik obtained three of the seven scrolls. And here is this classic photo of him in his study, uh, looking at one of the scrolls, rolled it out, put it under glass to protect it, and so on. What were these first three scrolls? A copy of the book of Isaiah, not complete. It's about one third of the book. 
It's not the famous Isaiah scroll, which we'll get to in a moment, and therefore we call this the second Isaiah scroll. Wonderful. It's not going to teach us anything remarkably new because we've always had the book of Isaiah, right? It's like my, my, my Homer or my Shakespeare analogy, right? It's not like we didn't have this composition before. It's always been part of the biblical canon. But we now had the oldest manuscript of a biblical book. And to give you a sense of what this meant, prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, our oldest manuscripts in Hebrew came from the Middle Ages, from around the year 900 CE. This is about 100 BCE, so a millennium earlier. And of course, that causes great excitement, even though the text is essentially the text as we've always known it. But then there were two new documents, two new compositions that neither Sukenik nor any other scholar had ever seen before. This one called the War Scroll. Its technical name is the, um, the, the Scroll of the War between the Sons of Light and the Sons of Darkness. The people who wrote this saw themselves as the sons of light and all others as the sons of darkness. We'll come back to that point. And the third text that Sukenik obtained was a, a new collection of poetry that no one had ever seen before, uh, evoking the book of Psalms, but not the Psalms. It's a totally new collection of poetry called uh, by in Hebrew, Hodayot, or in English, Thanksgiving hymns. And so these are these new texts, right? The Book of Isaiah copy, fine, that's wonderful. But now two new documents that had never been found, never been read, had been part of the Jewish tradition 2,000 years ago, uh, but had fallen out and had never you know, made it into the regular text that Jews, Christians, or anybody ever read. And there again is Professor Sukenik. Now, Kando took the other four documents of the original seven and did the following. Um, as I said, he was a member of the Syrian Orthodox Church and he attended the local church in Bethlehem. But the head of the whole community is, was this man named Mar Samuel, known as the Syrian Metropolitan, something like a bishop or archbishop in the hierarchy of the Syrian Orthodox Church. Uh, we all just call him Mar Samuel. Mar is the Aramaic word for Mr. or Sir or Lord or something like that. And you can see him here in all of his um, clerical uh, garb and clerical regalia. And um, that is the church on the left in the old city of Jerusalem, known as St. Mark's Monastery. And you see him there on the right reading one of the scrolls. And I love showing this to people. Um, also, back in October of 2022, uh, last time my wife and I were in Israel, we went into St. Mark's Monastery, and there it is, a full living color photograph, and you can see the bishop's canopied seat right here. That's where Mar Samuel is standing over here in this black and white photo from uh, 70 plus years ago. Here's a brand new uh, color photo to give you a sense of how wonderfully of, of vibrant and vivid the interior of the church is. Welcome to the wonders of uh, Jerusalem, especially the, the old city. Now, Mar Samuel, as I said, not a scholar of Hebrew, uh, took the four documents and he gave them to the, Amer to the scholars who were housed at the American Schools of Oriental Research, a lovely building as you see here in Jerusalem, uh, called ASOR for short. Now, what is this institution all about? Starting in the late 19th century and into the 20th century, the various European powers, plus the Americans, um, set up schools, research centers in Jerusalem. Uh, it's not like today where you can get on an airplane and you go and you come and you spend a week there maybe and come back. Uh, you obviously had to take a steamship overseas to get to Israel and then to get from the port to Jerusalem, which is inland. And you would go you know, for a semester or more likely a sabbatical year, and all the scholars needed places to stay, and it would serve as the springboard for their research, not just into the biblical text, which they could do from almost anywhere, the archeology span of the land, the topography of the land, the flora, the fauna, you could study all of this when you were in Israel. So we have a French school, which I'll show you in just a few moments, called the Ecole Biblique, a British school, a German school, a Swedish school, they're all being established, an Italian school run by the Jesuits, and a American school, as you see here. 
Mar Samuel gave the scholars the four scrolls and said, publish them, but I will retain ownership. You'll see why that's important in just a moment. And so the two scholars who were there that year were Miller Burroughs, the senior, and John Trevor, the more junior, and they were responsible for the publication of the scrolls entrusted to them by Mar Samuel. And I love showing this next image. It's John Trevor at work. This is high tech photography. I almost said digital. Of course, there's no digital. This is high tech photography. I guess he's got a light meter there in his hand. Uh, photographing a scroll with his camera mounted on a tripod and the lamp and uh, the lamps, right? This is as good as it got in 1947, 1948. A great figure of John Trevor doing early photography. Uh, of course, I'm going to show you these beautiful color images. This is the great Isaiah scroll, text number one of the four. This is the great Isaiah scroll, the complete book of Isaiah found in this scroll. This is the very beginning of it. And the next image is the end of it. Uh, I want to go back one to this one here to show you whether you can read Hebrew or not. You should know something about the physical properties of a scroll. These are all written on parchment. There are a handful of papyrus scrolls at Qumran. Most of these, all the ones I'm showing you, are on parchment. You take a sheet, a, a goat skin sheet, right? Parchment is animal skins, animal leather. You, and it's, you know, the tanner creates the very smooth surface for writing. You write three columns on a sheet, and you see the three columns here. And then you have another sheet with another three columns. You only see one of them here. And you take all the sheets and you sew them together. Look at the seam here, right? So this is how scrolls were manufactured in antiquity, and in fact, in the Jewish tradition are still used today for the reading of Torah in the synagogue, even though we've moved beyond scrolls into uh, eventually handwritten books, and then eventually, of course, printed books. Um, the second scroll entrusted to the ASOR scholars was a community rule, which turns out to be the most important of all of these scrolls. It is the one that describes how this community was organized. We'll come back to that in a moment. Here's the beginning of it. Again, you see three columns and the sheet seamed to the next sheet. And here is the end of that scroll. Um, Again, columns nine and 10 on the right, a seam and only one column needed there um, to finish the composition, column 11. The third text was called Pesher Habakkuk. Pesher means commentary. It's a commentary on the small biblical book of Habakkuk, one of the prophets of the Jewish Bible, Christian Old Testament. And again, just look at the physical properties of writing. We haven't even gotten to the contents yet, right? Look at the physical properties of writing. I want you to notice the guidelines. Uh, the scribe has scored his text with a fine uh, ink lines vertically for margins, horizontally for the letters. And I'm always fond of pointing out whether you can read Hebrew or not, you should be able to recognize this. Our tradition, English, we write above the line. In this tradition, you write below the line. So the letters are what we call hanging from the line, as you see here. The only Hebrew letter that goes above the line is this letter, Lamed, which has not quite a tail, an extender, we'll call it, head, uh, which goes above the line, the equivalent of our uh, sound L. Otherwise, you can see they're all hanging from the line. So just a little bit about the physical properties of these remarkable documents. And the fourth text was too brittle to unroll. Um, it eventually was unrolled uh, through some actually um, bespoke designed uh, machine uh, to cut some of the um, material away. Uh, but scholars early on knew that it had something to do with the book of Genesis because they could see the fragments had peeled off, had something to do with Noah and Abraham. Okay, what do you do when you're entrusted with Dead Sea Scrolls and now you're going to publish them? So Sukenik published the three that were given to him in 1950. Second edition came out five years later. That's the volume on the left. And Burroughs and Trevor and a third scholar, Brownlee, uh, published in two volumes the documents that were entrusted to them. So all the text, except for the one that couldn't be, on, couldn't be opened, six of the scrolls were published within uh, two to three years of publication. They did a yeoman job to open this whole field of study out up uh, to the uh, to the scholars in the rest of the world. Now, a little bit of geopolitics. Uh, if you know the history of the region, uh, in 1948, Israel became independent. 
Um, and the uh, kingdom of Jordan claimed uh, the eastern part of Jerusalem. So this is the old city of Jerusalem right here, which fell totally into Jordanian hands. Uh, this is the newer part uh, of the capital of Israel. And in between is a no man's land um, where the UN uh, uh, peacekeeping forces were stationed. Now I'm showing you these two arrows. Sukenic is where the arrow is indicated there in West Jerusalem. And the Asor scholars are at the, Albra, at the Asor school uh, in East Jerusalem where you see they're about two kilometers apart from one another, but because of the, um, the official state of war, notwithstanding the ceasefire and the UN no man's land, uh, they had no contact with one another. They were unable to, con to be in contact with one another. It's fascinating that in these early years of Dead Sea Scrolls scholarship, obviously Sukena could buy their books and they could buy his books and vice versa, wherever you were in the world, but there was no direct communication unless they met which they did at a conference in Europe someplace. Um, so there you have uh, that distance. Now, the immediate question was, who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? Sukenik was the first person to come up with the hypothesis and all scholars agreed with him early on. Now, to our good fortune, to our great fortune, we have the testimony of the Jewish historian Josephus who lived uh, in the first century CE so it's a little bit after the heyday of Qumran. And he wrote voluminous um, histories of the Jews in Greek. He actually was explaining Judaism and Jewish customs and Jewish history to the Greco-Roman world, the Greek speaking world in the Eastern end of the Mediterranean, and even the educated Romans in Rome itself who knew Greek. Josephus mentions that there were four different sects of Jews, Sadducees, Pharisees, Essenes, and Zealots. And, um, uh, they all had different features about them, their beliefs, their practices, their theology. They were all a little bit different from one another. Um, and Sukenik realized that the content of the scrolls, now we're getting to the content, matched Josephus's description of the Essenes. So, for example, Josephus tells us that the Essenes led a communal lifestyle, unlike all other Jews who lived in private homes with private families. The Essenes had a series of initiation rites. If you wanted to become a member, you had to go through a training period, an initiation period, before you became a full-fledged member. The Essenes believed in predetermination. By, con by contrast, the Sadducees believed only in free will. God has created the world. Everybody agreed with that. Um, but to what extent does God govern the world? The Essenes said totally. Everything is predetermined predestined. The Sadducees said no, for example, it's all free will. And the Pharisees had a middle ground, by the way, on, those, on, that, on that issue. Josephus tells us that some of the Essenes were celibate. It's the only time in the history of Judaism we know about celibacy. Uh, this is confirmed by a statement by a Jewish philosopher living in Alexandria, Egypt, from around the same time period named Philo. And Josephus also tells us that the Essenes were the strictest interpreters of Jewish law. So all of these five bullets are showing up in the community rule, in the commentary on the book of Habakkuk, in the war scroll, in the Thanksgiving hymns, right? The book of Isaiah wouldn't reveal anything because that's pan-Jewish, but all of these other issues are showing up in these texts, especially the community rule. And therefore, Sukenik creates what we call the Essene hypothesis. And seven and a half decades after they were discovered, that remains the most um, widely accepted theory about the Dead Sea Scrolls, including the one that I teach at Rutgers, including this semester when I'm teaching Dead Sea Scrolls to my wonderful undergraduate class. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. <coughs> now, a few select passages. In the community rule, we read the following. By these rules, I'm only giving you snippets, obviously, by these rules, they are to govern themselves, etc. And look at the last, <clears throat> sorry, I actually just finished that first sentence, um, with each legal finding that bears upon communal life. And then look at the last sentence, they shall eat together, they shall pray together, they shall deliberate together. Um, again, common meals, not by families and so on, 
They ate together. They prayed together. Well, probably most Jews did that. And they deliberated together, right? They had these like meeting halls where they would actually figure things out as a community group. Also in the community rule, this statement, <clears throat> this is our definition of predetermination. All that is now and ever shall be originates with the God of knowledge. Before things come to be, he has ordered all their designs so that when they do come to exist at their appointed times as ordained by his glorious plan, they fulfill their destiny. And now it doesn't get any better than this, a destiny impossible to change, right? No matter what you as a human do, you are unable to change the fate, the lot, the destiny that God has set for you. This is exactly what Josephus says about the Essenes. And now we understand that the Essenes are speaking themselves here through this ancient text discovered in 1947. Column six goes into these detailed initiation rites. And that's the Essene hypothesis. And then we have independent confirmation from a most surprising source. Pliny the Elder was a famous Roman polymath. He was an admiral in the Roman Navy, and he was a naturalist. He traveled the length and breadth of the Roman Empire. Remember, it reaches from the Atlantic Ocean in the West, um, <clears throat> including England, to uh, the land of Israel in the East. And he went all over the Roman Empire. A naturalist is, nobody is a naturalist today because we're all specialists, but a naturalist deals with geology, flora, fauna, right, animals, plant life, topography, the flow of rivers, anything, mountains, anything would fall within the purview of a naturalist. And he goes everywhere. Um, he didn't go to Israel to visit the Essenes, I say with a smile. He went there because he had heard about the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, we all learned this at some point, is the lowest spot on earth, minus 400 meters below sea level. Uh, it is the saltiest water on the earth, 10 times as salty as the oceans. Oceans are about three to 4% salt content. The Dead Sea is about 30 to 40% salt content. Nothing can live in it, hence the Romans called it Mare Mortum, the Dead Sea. In Hebrew, it's called the Salt Sea, by the way. So he goes to visit the region, and, and while he's there, he mentions that he encountered a group of Essenes living between Jericho and Ein Gedi. Here's his famous quotation. With no women among them, remember the celibacy issue, with no women among them, renouncing desire entirely without money, and my favorite, with only palm trees for company. Now, if we look at the map, there is nothing between Jericho and Ein Gedi. There is nothing, I repeat, between Jericho and Ein Gedi other than Qumran. It is clear that Pliny was at Qumran when he encountered the Essenes. And if you look at the Google, Google map, Google satellite view, you can see Jericho, which by the way is a large oasis which supports life. The red dot there is En Gedi, a smaller oasis which supports life. And again, there's nothing along that modern road today other than the site of Qumran along the western shore of the Dead Sea. And there are the palm trees still there. Okay, I just love taking pictures of things that will evoke um, the ancient text. So here are palm trees at the archeological site of Qumran, which we'll come to in a moment. And you can see some of the caves on the cliffs in the distance. Now, um, remember I told you that Mar Samuel retained ownership. We'll have our break in just two minutes. Remember I told you that Mar Samuel retained ownership of the texts. So what happens? The following happens. Mar Samuel comes to the US, okay? They're all published by now, but he still has the scrolls. The scholars at ASOR gave them back to him. He's still the owner. He comes to the US because his superior in the church hierarchy uh, uh, asked him to go to the US and to establish the Syrian Orthodox Church in North America because enough immigrants from the Middle East were coming to America now. And so Mar Samuel comes to uh, the U.S. to create a, a church hierarchy, a church structure here for the Syrian Orthodox uh, congregants in the U.S. and Canada. Where does he come? 
He comes to Hackensack, New Jersey. Okay, I say that with the biggest smile because here we are, not in Somerset County, but up north in Bergen County. He comes to Hackensack, New Jersey, where he sets up his church. He realizes that he has something of value here, and he wants to sell the Dead Sea Scrolls that are in his possession. How do you sell Dead Sea Scrolls? You can't make this up. This is why I spend half an hour telling you what happened. You take an ad out in the Wall Street Journal, right? The four Dead Sea Scrolls in the miscellaneous for sale category, right? Biblical manuscripts would make an ideal gift to an educational or religious institution. And I love that it's in that miscellaneous category with summer rentals and yachts. And right above it on the left, you can see a manufacturing plant in Kalamazoo and there are steel tanks for sale. And you can also pick up some Dead Sea Scrolls and I have to explain to my 20 year old students what it means to answer an ad in a newspaper, Box F 206, the Wall Street Journal, uh, 1954. So seven years have gone by since they were found and he brings the scrolls to America. By sheer coincidence, in that June of 1954, the young scholar Yigal Yadin was doing a speaking tour of the US. Yigal Yadin was a general in the Israeli army and one of the heroes actually of the 1948 War for Independence. You see he's wearing a military cap, but he had also done his PhD in biblical archeology span at the Hebrew University. And he, he wasn't reading the Wall Street Journal, but somebody called the ad to his attention while he was in the US. He knew exactly what they were, the four scrolls, everybody knew what they were, um, and he decided to buy them. As an Israeli citizen, however, he felt that he could not approach uh, Mar Samuel directly, who was technically a Jordanian citizen. If he had a passport, it would have been a Jordanian one. Um, and so he asked his uh, friend and colleague, Harry Orlinsky, who taught at Hebrew Union College in New York City, the Reform Jewish Seminary, where the uh, Reform rabbis are trained in New York, if Orlinsky would go and obtain the scrolls on his behalf. Yadin was able to find a donor in New York who supplied the funds. And Orlinsky went undercover as Mr. Green, as you see here, and he met Mar Samuel's agents in the lobby, can't make this up, of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, where the scrolls were kept in a vault in the basement, paid the money, got the scrolls, and gave them to um, Yigal Yadin. I'm happy to tell you that Harry Orlinsky was one of my teachers. Uh, when I was a doctoral student at New York University, the NYU and HUC campuses abut one another, and I studied with Professor Orlinsky, and he was a great raconteur and loved to tell stories, and he loved to regale us with the time that he posed as Mr. Green. Every once in a while, we actually read a biblical verse, but otherwise, he was just great at telling us stories about his life, his you know five minutes of fame as Mr. Green. Uh, what I didn't tell you until now is that Yigal Yadin is the son of Elazar Sukenik. Yes, they have different surnames. Uh, Sukenik, when he moved from Europe to Israel, retained his original uh, family name. Uh, Yadin took on a Hebrew name. Yadin is a good Hebrew name. Uh, and so these are father and son. When Yadin obtained the scrolls in 1954 through the ad in the Wall Street Journal, his father had passed away a year earlier. Uh, Yadin wrote, uh, Sukhani kept a diary also, by the way, but Yadin wrote in his memoir uh, how proud my father would be to know that his son was able to obtain the other four scrolls uh, on behalf of the government of Israel. So all seven of the original scrolls from Cave One, we're going to talk about all the others after the break, uh, eventually found their way to um, the Hebrew University and the eventually Israel Museum. So here are the four scrolls that Yadin obtained from Mar Samuel. I showed them to you uh, all earlier. Okay, we'll put the caves up for a moment and invite any of the questions that may have come in. And I think Fiona will be able to read them to me if there's any questions that haven't come in yet. Okay, we have one uh, from Susanna. She asks, I remember reading somewhere that female skeletons were found in Qumran. How does that fit in with their lifestyle? Okay, so let's put, let me answer that later. I want to show you a little bit of the archaeology and we'll talk about the cemetery at Qumran. Okay, so hold off on that. Yes, the answer is yes, there are female skeletons found in the graves at Qumran, but it's much more complicated than what I just said. We'll come back to that. Okay, Hester asks, how much do they pay for the four scrolls bought from Mar Samuel? Right, so I believe it is a public record, and I remember reading once $250,000 which uh, 70 years ago was a lot of money. I don't know what that would be in today's money. 
uh, millions, obviously. And of course, it doesn't matter anymore what it would be in today's money because none of these things could ever be sold. They're priceless. Okay, that's it for now. Good, great, excellent, good question. And we'll come back to the cemetery in a moment. Let's proceed. Now, uh, this is the, these are the caves. <clears throat> this is cave one, which is where the first scrolls were found. Um, but the, the cliff side that I showed you is filled with caves. Here, where it says Qumran, that actually refers to the archaeological site of Qumran. And by the way, I mentioned the Wadi Qumran. You see it flowing here. The archaeological site of Qumran, known as Khirbet Qumran. Khirbet is the Arabic word for ruin, an archaeological ruin. And by the way, we do not know what the word Qumran means. It's not attested in any of our ancient texts. It must be the name of the place that the Bedouin over the years have started calling the Wadi Qumran and the archaeological site of Qumran and the caves of Qumran and so on. Now, um, everybody realized that there probably is a connection. I mean, how did these scrolls get into this middle of nowhere place? There must be some connection between cave one where they were found and the nearest archaeological site right here. And we're talking about a mile. Um, and so everyone understood that we'd have to excavate the site of Qumran. Some stones were above the ground, so everybody knew there was some archaeological site there. Um, the person who was put in charge of doing so was um, Père Roland de Vaux, who's a Dominican priest, OP is the Order of the Dominicans, um, sent in Jerusalem. You may think of Dominicans and other Catholic orders as people living in monasteries and their um, secluded worlds, and to some extent that's true, but they're also definitely men of the world and scholars, and DeVoe was a first-class biblical scholar and our field archaeologist, as you can see here, not in his clerical garb on the left. So he goes out to Qumran, um, sponsored by the uh, Jordanian Department of Antiquities, and um, begins to excavate. This is his home in Jerusalem. I mentioned the French school. This is it, the École Biblique et Archéologique Française. It is a Dominican monastery, but it also has the best library of biblical studies um, in probably the world. That's how good it is. I have spent time here doing research, and it's just a wonderful um, institution. Uh, I, I'm going to you know, summarize several seasons of archaeological work by showing you this photo here which is the result of, of DeVoe's excavations. So when you do an excavation, you get the walls and the foundations, but you don't have the heights of the walls and the ceilings and the rooftops, but it gives us a floor plan. Uh, we know exactly what it looked like. Now, um, off to the side here, off to the bottom, actually down here, uh, I believe, is where the cemetery is. And I wasn't planning to talk about the cemetery, but since somebody asked, we'll talk about it right now. DeVoe did a few soundings. He excavated about a dozen uh, skeletons. There are about a thousand graves there. Uh, here's the problem. And yes, he did find females as well as males. Here's the problem. Uh, are these, um, are these 2000 year old skeletons? Are these medieval skeletons? Are they more modern Bedouin burials? Uh, we don't know. Um, nobody likes to treat human remains like we might treat other organic remains. So we didn't have it in DeVoe's day. Uh, it was just starting. But today we have a carbon-14 test. We could actually test these. But due to the respect of human remains, um, nobody wants to do a test to determine or dig any more graves. It was something that DeVoe did uh, for better or for worse. Uh, I think another person went out there and excavated another five or six. So yes, there are females there, but we don't even know if they're connected to the Qumran community. And it doesn't matter one way or the other really, because even though Pliny said he saw these men there living without women, um, we do know that from Josephus and Philo, there were some Essenes who were celibate and there were some, celib some Essenes who married. So maybe there were some married Essenes at the site. We don't know how to explain the female skeletons, but I'll just leave it at that and thank you for the question. Notice, by the way, the big cistern right here, and there are some smaller cisterns. You see the water channel running right here, right? 
So they would collect all the floodwaters from the rainy season and divert it into the site, and that would last them throughout uh, the dry summer months. What did DeVoe find? A dining hall, right? one big dining hall. And how do we know it's a dining hall? Off to the side there on the right is the pantry where they found about a thousand clay vessels, serving vessels, cooking vessels, everything imaginable was found there, telling us that this was a kitchen, although DeVoe called it the pantry. And there are no private homes found at Qumran. In other words, if you excavated any other site, you would find private homes. There are none here. There's just the big, sorry, there's the big communal dining hall, um, the largest room in the complex, and the pantry off to the right. It fits into the Qumran Essene hypothesis. Oh, they ate their meals together. Not far away is the scriptorium. Sorry, there's the pantry. Not far away is the scriptorium and we call this the scriptorium because in this room were found writing tables and ink wells. Anything that you could remove to a museum, you do, but you know, the site remains as you see it here. So here are the writing tables, which were restored from fragments. We don't even think they wrote on these tables, by the way, they probably wrote on their laps, but these tables would have been used to roll out the sheets and to sew them together, okay? Um, and then ink wells, okay, with ink in them. Right. which have all been tested today by chemists. Okay, everything gets a test today in the age of our specialization. Also at Qumran, multiple ritual baths, Hebrew singular mikvah, plural mikvahot, um, which they used for purification. Now, all Jews did that. All Jews had to undergo purification rituals at different times. But at Qumran, they were much more, uh, they had a stricter idea of what causes purity and impurity. And so they had, um, these uh, ritual baths throughout the site. How do we know the date? Well, because we have coins. Um, and you can see the, um, the, the, the earliest coin is from the mid second century. And the latest coin is dated to 68 CE. The Romans would be coming through the land at that po point and eventually would destroy Jerusalem uh, two years later and Masada three years after that. Um, but notice how the coins were found in a pot. When you do an excavation, you find a few coins here and a few coins there. I've done excavations. I mean, you're always finding coins. If it's from the Roman period, especially where we have so many coins, these were all found in a single pot. Remember what Pliny said, they had no wealth. Remember what Josephus said, they pooled their resources as part of their communal lifestyle. This is literally the communal pot right here with all the coins found together. Now, um, Go back to cave one, which you see there in the center. Scholars realized that there were all manner of caves on that cliffside. Let's go explore them. After all, if you find cave, if you find um, scrolls in one cave, you probably will find scrolls in another. So while DeVoe is doing his work at the site right here, another team of scholars, with the help of the Bedouin who know the terrain better than anyone else, are combing the caves. And eventually 11 caves, 10 additional ones, totaling 11 caves, you see them on the map, all yielded um, literary remains. And you see most of them are centered right around the site of Qumran. They were numbered in the order they were found. So cave one, cave two, cave three, or to the north, and then all the caves around Qumran, and then eventually cave 11 to the north. Cave four is the most important to them because it yielded by itself about two thirds of the Dead Sea Scrolls came right out of cave four. Unfortunately, not preserved in vessels, but just strewn on the floor of the cave is what you see here. And they're therefore all fragmentary. When I say all fragmentary, this is what I mean. And they all had to be pieced back together, studied, cataloged, aligned with each other based on handwriting and other analyses to create an entire corpus, 800 plus documents, but thousands and tens of thousands of actual fragments, right? This is, these are, you know, these are nine fragments of one text right down here. Uh, they took them all to the um, PAM, now known as the Rockefeller Museum, and they, in Jerusalem, and they laid them out for scholars to study. And they created a team of scholars um, to analyze, catalog, and so on. And these are these iconic photographs from the 1950s of scholars going through 
like jigsaw puzzles, and tr except we don't have the complete puzzle right, or even the box with the picture, to make some semblance, uh, a semblance of order out of the chaos of, of, of these fragments. And now when I show you this, I have to tell you my students love this. Um, any, anybody have a problem with this picture? Right, the sun is just shining right in on the fragments, but you ain't seen nothing yet. Any, got, got, anybody have a problem with this picture, right? Welcome to 1950s, okay? And I tell my students who are aghast, I said, go watch one episode of, of um, Mad Men and you'll understand people were smoking everywhere back in the 50s and 60s. I mean, it's just staggering, shocking to look at a picture like this. Um, by the way, Yadin, who's now the great scholar in West Jerusalem and DeVoe, the great scholar in East Jerusalem, again, are still not in direct contact with one another because of the geopolitical situation. They did communicate through an intermediary in Paris. They would send letters and the person in Paris reposted them. Okay, when the dust cleared, here are the 800 plus documents and about a fourth of them are biblical texts. And you see that you have mainly sectarian texts, which is to say they speak to the Essene theology and the Essene beliefs and the Essene practices. Every biblical book except Esther is represented by at least one copy. There were more copies of Psalms and then Deuteronomy and then Isaiah than any other of the biblical books, as you can see from this table. And these biblical manuscripts tend to match up with the later medieval copies of the Bible, but every once in a while we find what we call a variant text. There was a fluidity, the text wasn't quite struck, uh, um, settled yet. Um, by Jewish scribes. My favorite example, Isaiah chapter 6, many of you know the passage, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Uh, that's the standard translate, that's the standard version. And But at the Qumran Isaiah scroll, it says holy, holy only twice. Okay, so it's not going to change the world whether you recite this word twice or three times when you say this passage, very commonly recited in both Jewish and Christian liturgy. Um, I like to quip, if you think the church service or the synagogue service is a little bit too long. Here's your ancient license to omit one version of the word kadosh, holy, and you can shorten your uh, service. Ha ha ha. There's our chart again. Naturally, it's the sectarian literature that informs us the most about this community. Today, they are all housed at this newly built museum, relatively new, Shrine of the Book, a, a part of the Israel Museum complex in Jerusalem. Now, these were those things that we talked about earlier. They're all part of Essene lifestyle, uh, as described by Josephus and Philo and Pliny, and they're all to be found in these scrolls. Um, I hadn't talked about this last bullet here, strict, uh, strict interpretation of Jewish law. Actually, let me say something about the celibacy issue. In that original document, the community rule, uh, there are no mention of women or children. So that fed into the Essene hypothesis as well. Uh, eventually, other texts show that there were mention of women and children and, and marriage and divorce, uh, so which may be some are for the non-marrying Essenes and some are for the marrying Essenes, exactly what Josephus tells us. Um, but as far as the strictest interpretation of Jewish law, let me just give you two examples. The um, a particular document at Qumran, here's some fragments of it, um, Damascus is a metaphor, it doesn't mean Damascus itself. Uh, states that one may not travel uh, on the Sabbath more than a thousand cubits. Uh, the later rabbinic tradition is more liberal. It allows you 2,000 cubits. Uh, and the Qumran community is stricter, exactly like Josephus says. Only a walk of a thousand cubits is permitted. The idea is beyond that, you're no longer engaging in Sabbath rest. You're, you're exerting yourself beyond, uh, perhaps for some work-related thing. Why would you have to travel more than a thousand cubits behind your home? beyond your home, the rabbi said 2,000. Okay, fine. The second one, uh, Jewish tradition holds that all cooked food must be um, prepared on Friday before Sabbath starts Friday at sundown. Uh, all Jews would agree to that. But the mainstream, and I use that word with quotation marks, there really is no, at this time, no mainstream or normative or standard Jewish practice. What becomes the normative Jewish practice is, um, only cooked food needs to be prepared in advance. Uncooked food, if you want to make a salad for Saturday lunch, right? Or today, you know, more modern, you can make a sandwich for Saturday lunch, right? 
there's no cooking involved. You can do that on the Sabbath. The Qumran community was so strict that you could not, you see the passage here, all food had to be prepared on Friday before the Sabbath, which once again is exactly what Josephus says. Josephus' Essenes are reverberated in these Dead Sea Scrolls, or the, 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 the viewpoints of these Dead Sea Scrolls match exactly what Josephus says about this group of Jews, first century BCE, first century CE. In 1967, the Six Day War occurred. We always have to go sort of back and forth here between the ancient and the modern, and you'll see why. Um, Kando was still holding on to a scroll. Rumors were that he always had a scroll. Uh, Yadin, still back into the Israeli army now, um, when the Israeli army got to Bethlehem, uh, entered Kando's shop and said, I understand you have another scroll, and Kando sold it to Yadin. I mean, we, I don't know the price on this one. I don't think it's ever been made public. But Yadin was able to buy from Kando one last scroll. Uh, all Kando knows, knew is that it came from Cave 11. So whenever they were exploring those caves, the Bedouin must have brought it to Kando. And it turned out to have been the longest of all the scrolls called the Temple Scroll because it provides the, um, the, the, the Essene view of what the Temple in Jerusalem should be like. They did not like the way the other Jews, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, were performing the sacrificial worship in the temple. And they remo removed themselves from the temple. They were temple-centered, priestly oriented, but they couldn't participate in what they believed to be an impure temple. And so they set up their own little commune, as it were, out there in their self-imposed exile uh, in the desert. I mean, this is just one example um, according to the temple scroll, if you want to bring olive oil or wine to the temple, you're a farmer, you're a vineyard, uh, you have vines or you have olive groves, and you want to supply the temple for the rituals with wine or olive oil, uh, you bring them in animal skins, right? You can't carry them in those heavy jugs, porcelain, um, earthenware jugs, but animal skin, leather skin bottles, like the kind the Bedouins still use, they're lightweight and you can bring your liquids in them. Um, and that's what Jews did. The Essenes believed that you could only convey liquids to the temple in animal skins, which were slaughtered at the temple. In other words, there was such a holiness or purity about that, that you couldn't just go find a goat from the herd, kill it for its meat, go to the tanner, get the skin bottle that you need and bring your liquids to Jerusalem. You had to go to Jerusalem to buy a skin that was actually manufactured by a tanner from a goat that was sacrificed on the altar in the temple in Jerusalem, then come back home and then make a second trip with the thing now full. They therefore considered the temple impure because Jews were, in their view, defiling the city and defiling the temple through such liberal practices. This is a much stricter view of Jewish law. Josephus informs us that unlike all other Jews, the Essenes did not sacrifice. All Jews took part in the temple worship. He doesn't tell us why they did not sacrifice. The Dead Sea Scrolls now provide the answer, right? The, the temple was polluted in their mind and they could not bring themselves to um, operate in that temple and engage in the sacrificial worship of God. They retreated, as I said, to the desert. So where is sanctity to be found? If the temple is no longer the sanctuary, is no longer the holy place, one of their texts refers to the community, I'll read the Hebrew, mikdash adam, which means a sanctuary or a holiness of man, meaning humanity or of men, right? They, the community, become the holiness. No longer that polluted temple in Jerusalem, that's no longer holy it's no longer sacred we the community becomes sacred and now towards the end of our presentation i want to link up with some of the ideas that flow into early christianity after all jesus is alive at the very time of the flourishing of the qumran community in the gospel of john jesus says famously he also is you know has a problem with the temple and the way it was viewed not where it was operating not because of the not for the 
for different reasons than the Essenes, but he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Now, New Testament scholars don't think that Jesus is talking about building a whole new structure, like, you know, new stones and all that. They understand, as the context makes clear, that when Jesus says, I will destroy the temple, temple, after all, is nothing more than the word you see here, mikdash, holy place, sanctuary, sanctity, sacredness. It's all one word in Hebrew, mikdash. What Jesus means is that I will raise up a community of holiness, right? Uh, which you can do in three days. You can't rebuild a temple in three days. So the idea that the community becomes the holiness is an idea that bridges the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, the followers of Jesus. Now, uh, this is complicated. I'll try to simplify it in the interest of time. I'm cognizant of the clock here. Um, in Jewish practice, according to the Bible, you use the mikvah, the ritual bath, to remove impurity. If you um, contacted the dead, if you buried the dead, uh, if you menstruated, uh, you had all sorts of reasons why you had to remove your impurity. These are natural things that one does, uh, intercourse, even procreation. These are natural parts of life. There's nothing bad or about it. In fact, some of these are very, very good things to do. For example, producing a family, burying the dead, treating the deceased with honor and so on. So you just do these things, you become impure and you purify yourself. That's the way it's laid out in the book of Leviticus. Um, the Qumran community saw impurity as equivalent to sin, to evil. Therefore, you could only go into the ritual bath if you repented of evil and pure impurity all at once. It commingled sort of the XY axis of purity, impurity, with the XY axis of good and evil. And so you can see from this text that the, the ritual bath is not necessarily for the removal of impurity, although that also, it's for the removal of evil, sinfulness. Have you ever heard of such a thing before? Well, the answer is yes. That's what John the Baptist is doing in the gospels, including in the very first uh, few verses of Mark. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness. Notice the geography, in the wilderness, preaching a baptism. What does baptism mean? Ritual immersion in a ritual bath or in a river. Preaching a baptism of repentance, not to remove impurity, but for the forgiveness of sins. And so John the Baptist, the gospel writers tell us, took people out of Jerusalem down to the Jordan River, and there they immersed in the waters of the Jordan River and they removed their sinfulness. This becomes a core tenet of Christianity. Now, for many, many years, scholars, we always knew that Christianity, of course, is an outgrowth of Judaism, but scholars would say, well, where did this come from? It's not a Jewish concept. The waters are to be used for the removal of impurity, not sin. There are other ways to atone for sin, the holiday of Yom Kippur and so on. You don't immerse yourself to atone for sin. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, and it now turns out it was a Jewish custom. It just wasn't the Jewish customs that we knew. But there you have another connection between the Essenes and early Christianity. If you look at the map and you consider that John the Baptist took people out of Jerusalem and went to the Jordan River to have them immerse, we're talking about the lower part of the Jordan right here before it flows into the Dead Sea. You see the geography. As I always like to say, we don't know whether John the Baptist stopped for lunch at Qumran. I wanna hear laughter, everybody. We don't know if John the Baptist stopped for lunch at Qumran, but when you see the same practice and the same geography, there has to be some contact here between this group and the followers of Jesus. And there again is the topographical map or satellite view to give you a sense. Upper right, the baptismal site of Jesus Christ according to tradition along the Jordan, uh, Qumran, and uh, you see Jerusalem and Bethlehem to the left, and the vastness of the wilderness that you see there. Um, the commentary on the book of Habakkuk says that you must, your conduit to God is through a particular person known as the teacher of righteousness. He is the founder of the Essene group. We don't know his name. He only gets the title, the teacher of righteousness. You individually need to approach God through the teacher of righteousness. Other Jews would have believed that you had a direct conduit to God either through the sacrifices in the temple or through your personal prayers or whatever it was. 
But this group sees an intermediary between you, average person, and the divine. And that is the teacher of righteousness. This is, again, what uh, Christianity believes. Of course, it's Jesus who is the conduit. And to solidify the connection, this passage uh, from the book of Habakkuk, but the righteous uh, by his faith shall live, is quoted three times in the New Testament in the letters of Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews. Um, New Testament scholars continue to debate to what extent did Paul write all the letters, Romans and Galatians, he probably did, Hebrews maybe he did, maybe he did not, but it doesn't matter. The New Testament writers, Paul or whomever, are quoting um, the same biblical verse, but instead of the teacher of righteousness, it's obviously Jesus. The faith that you see in the biblical verse is the faith that you have in this individual who is close to God, the teacher who would have been considered totally human, or Jesus, who is part of the Trinity in Christian um, belief. The war scroll, which I mentioned at the outset, the sons of light against the sons of darkness, presents an apocalyptic battle, very similar to the ap apocalyptic view of Christianity, which you see especially in the book of Revelation, the last book of the New Testament. If you can read Hebrew, you see the words I've highlighted, sons of light, b'nei or, sons of darkness, b'nei choshech. And there's that text again. So connections, conclusion, between the Dead Sea Scrolls and early Christianity, the way they interpret biblical texts, the way they use Habakkuk chapter two, verse four, the leader of the sect as the conduit, sin and impurity conjoined, and the apocalyptic view of the eschaton, which is, uh, which, which is either here and present or soon to be in the view of the Essenes and the early Christian community. Conclusion, some Qumran slash Essene ideas percolated into Christianity. They did not become Christians, but maybe some of them did, but their ideas percolated into Christianity. That's clear from what we've just seen. But we also know that some Qumran and Essene ideas persisted deep into the Middle Ages. There's a Jewish group in the Middle Ages called the Karaites who did not follow the main rabbinic tradition. They have, to a great extent, some of the ideas that we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the community may have ceased to exist when the Romans came through the land and destroyed uh, Qumran. More likely, they abandoned the site, deposited their scrolls in the caves, hoping one day to return. Um, and of course, they did not return until a goat strayed from the herd in 1947, opening up a whole new world of scholarship. Welcome to the, uh, welcome to the wonderful, fascinating world of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Thank you very much.